This episode is brought to you by Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic, a two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic formulated with 24 clinically and scientifically studied strains to support healthy regularity and your gut, immune, and skin health. Optimize your gut health. Visit seed.com slash Spotify with code Spotify for 30% off your first month of Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. This episode is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear. It's snowing again, and that wind chill is killer. But you're not worried about that because you shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection. It's warmth perfected with tiny gold dots that reflect your body heat inside and protect you from the cold outside. No snow or chilly temps can stop you now. Go out anyway. Shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection now at Columbia.com slash infinity. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA member FDIC. Terms apply. Hello and welcome to a new podcast, The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. In part two, I spoke to Jacob about his rehab in France and at the Injured Jockeys Fund site at Oxy House. We then went on to talk about Jacob's ambitions for the future. Well, can we now go back to when you arrived in hospital you spent 178 days in hospital what what do you what do you remember about the early days in the hospital terrible food <laughs> terrible food well, french french uh, food's always supposed to be you know the uh, culinary highlight well, of europe hospital but, food yeah. hospital food is is well yeah terrible food um and i remember it being incredibly hot because it's middle of summer, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Middle of summer, middle of Paris. And it was a hot summer last year. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of pain, really. A lot of pain those first what, five what weeks. Was, what was the full extent of your injuries when you arrived? at? The- um, I had a chipped C6 in my neck, chipped a bone, dislocated C7 from C6 in my neck. I broke T3, T4, and T6 in my back. T4 was so badly damaged that that had caused a compression on my spinal cord. I'd broken my sternum. I broke four ribs. And as a result of that, I damaged my left lung as well. So I'd done a good job. You certainly had that. that, There must have been some very dark days when you're first in there i was only thinking myself what what can you think when you're on your own and um when you're awake when you full extent of your injuries which you've just revealed how how can you feel then well the first week i can't really remember too much to be honest um my mum like i said my mum and dad came that night and they stayed, my mum stayed with me for every day, bar I think three or four days she wasn't with me. I remember seeing Felix on the, the, the following day after my accident. Um, it was at a time in France where the COVID was never bad enough to, to, to not allow visitors. We were limited on how many people, but that was basically what got me through was the visitors. Um, if it hadn't been for that, if I'd have been in England, then I don't know how I would have coped but the lads were very very good I was a bit you know because you you, you'd think oh these jump jockeys they you don't want to almost be reminded of what the job can cause and that always and I can't thank them enough for putting that aside out of their heads and just you know they really just were there for me and um so they came and saw me a lot I had family friends come over within the first six weeks um, in the Parisian hospital. 
and yeah it was all down to them really it was all about support and um and immediately the first thing i did was was try to look towards the future and what and kind of in a strange way there was a bit of a relief that because i was still trying to make it as a jockey and it was always playing on my mind and it was always getting me down that i hadn't made it and will i make it in a strange way there was a bit of a relief that that was over that pressure that i was putting on myself to make it as a professional jockey because i wanted it so badly that was gone so then i could kind of then there was a release forward. thing there was a release from that sort of pressure yeah yeah and then also i looked and then i remember just wanting to see my friends a lot and it made me instantly realize that god there is so much more to life and how important my friends are because i was almost putting everything into one riding thing. was everything yeah. and my social life was having a an effect and you know i was i was very tired and therefore miserable and didn't want to be you know and it was just like yeah i was almost like in a small way kind of it was a little bit of i was quite glad in a, in a small way um uh, probably uh, how did it affect your parents because they must have spent a lot of time in a foreign country well i joked that they basically got a you know they got a summer in paris but uh it wasn't well, quite the, the was circumstance good, yeah. yeah they were it wasn't quite in the circumstances uh that that they would have liked um they've been fantastic yeah yeah they've um i mean from what i've seen they've been as strong as a rock obviously i can't comment on what what they what happens behind closed doors but um yeah of course it's been hard um it's been hard for all of them but i suppose they it it's funny that they take strength from how i have dealt with it but then had the reason i've dealt with it so well is because of them so um but it's been it was definitely a blow on all of the family yeah grandparents included did you have to move hospitals a few times as well and and what was the physio like yeah after seven weeks in the hospital in the center of paris they took me to uh to the west of paris to gash which is like the stoke mandeville equivalent in france um for high speed crashes and collisions that affect your spinal cord it was a, a long four months doing rehab and you saw your life experience grew in that four months probably than it more than it would in in however amount of years because you could never feel too sorry for yourself for too long there because i only had to look across at my roommate in the early part of his rehab and the poor bloke would have to watch me being able to put shoes on and a t-shirt on and he was still at the stage i was a couple months earlier do you know what i mean where you're getting bed bathed unfortunately you have to have your the toilet done in the bed you know it 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 it's it it, it was that that's how bad it was early on it, you know you, you were everything was everything was happening in the bed um you know i'm not as shy as i was that's for sure already war because you you lose all decency and um yeah i always joke that once once you once a once about 200 nurses have seen you naked then you know there's there's really nothing no, nothing that, that that can't be said but yeah when the, there was time there were some really tough times i remember thinking there were there were stages when everyone was starting to up and walk you know and it was like why me why why not me um and then a week later you were the only one transferring onto a to a bed by yourself onto a into a physio bed so yeah very up and down there was a period which got very hard when France went into lockdown and I was stuck in the hospital for 6 weeks. Um but at the same time I had some brilliant times at the hospital because they took us out land sailing. I think it was in the October I went land sailing and um 
with the hospital, so kind of by myself, and it was a good tester. And then after that, I was unable to go out on weekends, and I got to go to the Arc de Triomphe and got taken into the Coolmore Suite because they couldn't have any runners. So, um, And then I went to the Grand Steeplechase de Paris for the French Gold Cup and got to see my good friend Louisa Carberry win the Gold Cup. So, And in a weird way, I wouldn't have ever done that if it wasn't for the accident because I never would have, if, you know, it's the wheelchair kind of got me there in a, in a, in yeah. a strange way. Um, so when did you actually come back to the UK? Are you, I say we 178 days that's six months. So was that about the end of the year, Christmas time or? Yeah, I did. I did Christmas in France because the, everyone had been so good to me and if it wasn't for the accident, I'd have done Christmas in France anyway. So I went, I did a little tour of France, 10 days post acts, post I left the hospital. I did 10 days in France and I went and saw my old yard. I went and went down to Poe and had a big party for my birthday. And it was probably, it was really good because nothing was easy in terms of accessibility and bedrooms and stuff. And all my friends were brilliant, carrying me up, up and down stairs. Um, and then, yeah, came back to England on the 29th of December. And then it was then, and then we were in lockdown again over in England. So dad had already been back in the UK since October, adapting the house, um, which, you know, couldn't have been easy on, on them because that was a, stressful enough thing to go through you know because we didn't know how to what to do to the house that must be we a big all job. New. yeah it's just it's just kind of mentally trying to visualize the wheelchair in the house and how it would work and then and then it did turn out to be a big job because my mum and we had to swap bedrooms we had to install a lift um to go from the dining room straight up into the into the my bedroom there was alterations to the bathroom to turn into a wet room and it was like what layout's going to work um and then do we and then there was also floors because wheelchairs do not like carpet and so that that was another thing and yeah you know when obviously covid so nobody's you know available um the council were backlogged with other things um yeah he had a tough tough two months out in england getting that sorted and then also you then had mum living in france by herself dealing with a 24 year old 23 year old person who at times was not very easy to deal with um uh let alone the language barrier of trying to get paperwork done um so we came home and we basically i think i spent a month in the house and i saw my grandparents probably wasn't meant to and yeah it was hard because you'd spent the last six months speaking to everyone saying we'll meet up when you go home and then we and went you, into lockdown you go, yeah. and you go home and you don't see anyone and then the also the plan was was to come home and almost go straight into Oxy to continue that that rehabilitation so that you don't lose it and we couldn't do that either so i think i did two days in the january as a taster at Oxy house because they didn't know what how fit i was or if i could do anything from a um and then I think, yeah, if I remember correctly, February was another month at home. And March, I think I did a week at Oaksy House. And then it was another five weeks at home. It, yeah, it was, that was almost at times harder than the, the six months in the hospital. I was going to say, I was going to say, I mean, it was hard for all of us, but uh, it must have been even harder for you when we've got complete lockdown and, uh, you couldn't get to the injured jockey fund Oaksy house on a regular basis to carry on all the rehabilitation you'd done for the previous six months. No, it, no. And I took it, took a lot of it for granted because 
when we went into lockdown in France, you were still, I was still riding out in, in when it first happened in the March and the April, because obviously the horses still had to be looked after. And in France, it was only 10 weeks of no racing. So we got back to racing a lot quicker than, than they did in England. So, and you basically lived with who you worked with, who you, who were your best friends. So I, I never really fully appreciated how hard it was. And then again, you're in hospital and in your, your rehab was your job. That's how I looked at it. It was a job. It was up at eight o'clock, two hours to get yourself showered, toilet, dressed, down to rehab for 10, two hours of rehab, lunch for an hour and a half. You know, there was a, there was a schedule, almost very similar to your day in a racing stables. And then I came home and there was, there was nothing to, to get up for. Um, probably did me actually some good looking back in because it allowed my body to heal and rest. And actually I then re- I remember going to physio in the March time and I had actually below the level of injury in my core stuff, the muscle started to flick on and off. So there'd been a bit of, um, healing had done there bit of almost regeneration and I kind of look back and think would that have happened if I'd have just kept hammering everything so and then since then more and more regeneration and I've I've, I've managed to gain more and more core strength I mean nothing that would help me sit up to to that type of degree but in terms of posture in terms of seated balance it's it's been being able to to regain that has been a big help from such a high level injury and how often and now are you going to the um, injured jockeys fund at Oaksy House? I go, I did a, the full month of June to really try and, you know, see what, see what would happen if I did a full month of, and uh, yeah, that was quite hard. That was very full on. And I'm going, and I'm, I'm now going to do, I've would just done two, I've just done two weeks now. So yeah, the end of August, I've just I've just done my two week stint now. So I had six weeks off, and I've just finished doing two weeks uh, in in at the end of August. And and looking to the future, on really positive news, you've um, joined Team GB's Future Stars program for table tennis. How did that come about? Yeah, um, well, we used it as a form of rehab. And I played it in school and I was like, this could be something I could get into here and compete at. It's not, it's a very accessible sport. You know, it's, there's not a lot of high costs in terms of bats and stuff. So, and I was, I, we bought a table at home and I remember speaking to someone one day and they said, oh, how's the table tennis going? And I didn't really have much of an answer because it wasn't really going anywhere obviously COVID hadn't helped. So I, I just rang up British Para Table Tennis and basically told them who I was, what had happened and what, where I want to go and what I want to do. So they signed me up to this Future Stars. The pathway coach, Sean Marples, rang me and said, shall we have a Zoom call and a, and a, and a, get and a meet and greet? You know, showed a lot of interest, which I really liked. And then he got me into a club. He came down and joined me on that day again, showing interest. Um, said, "Yeah, there's some, there's some talent here. There's, there's the possibility to to improve a lot." Um, there's a two day camp in Sheffield in in July. It was for other future stars players. Um, so I went down to that. I was the only person in a wheelchair on the Future Stars, but there were some other Team GB players in wheelchairs. And um, and off the back of that, I then got invited to a two-day camp, but for the team above Future Stars, um, which was really, really, um, well, it was, just, it was just brilliant, really. Um, so is, they, it, is they, it that they, competitive, competitive element as a sportsman that you want to still play sport? Yeah, no, be, definitely because 
I had, I had, you know, I was only a jockey for two and a half years and I felt like I, I didn't do it for long enough and I hadn't achieved what I probably wanted to achieve. So there's definitely that drive in me to, to get more success, to be, you know, to prove myself as being, you know, get as, as successful. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so definitely want to be more competitive and, and I'm young as well. So it now is the right time to do it. That was, that was the other thing. Um, and I've read you, you're looking to, is it, is it a Paralympic sport then table tennis? Um, yes. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. So team GB have got 13 Paralympians at Tokyo for table tennis two one gold at Rio. So that'll be exciting. See if they can defend their titles. Um, I, I'm not going to aim, I mean, maybe I should, but I'm not going to aim for Paris because if I was going to, it would mean Monday to Friday of table tennis as of, as of this Monday type of thing. Because we've and only got a three-year uh, gap, haven't we, for this Olympics? Yeah, yeah. And after six years of working in racing and missing holidays and moving to France away from family, I just feel like, well, I, I said, I said after the accident that I, that I was going to take time off to rehab and I was going to enjoy life a bit. Cause like I said, you know, there was, you kind of realized that there are things more important like your friends and, and seeing people. So I wouldn't, if I was to focus on Paris, if there was a family birthday, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to go to it. Whereas these next three years it is a case of right I want to go there on that day or do that on that day and and enjoy life and 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 make the most of it and um but whilst still training obviously and I will be competing in order to get to the stage that post Paris Olympics I'm ready to really put the next four years of dedication into to try and make the LA squad if I can well, the best of luck with that. And, and you're also, uh, uh, you want to become a, a bloodstock agent as well. I've seen you visiting some studs recently on uh, Twitter and, and Instagram. Yeah, that was, that was probably my first um, thing that popped into my head post-accident post um, of what I wanted to do. Again, probably being at a yard like Emmanuel's, where he sold so many great horses to Ireland and then you're riding the half brother or the half sister. It, it always got you interested in, in the sales a little bit and, and the, the, the pedigrees and also being at some arcs that kind of kickstarted it looking at the pedigrees from the book one horses that he bought and the book two horses. And it was like, Oh, we've bought, we've bought this as a potential Derby horse or, you know, or, or all of Kirsten Rousing's brilliant pedigrees that she had. So there was always a keen interest there. Um, but it was just, obviously I was kind of thrown into it a little bit sooner than probably ideal in a way. But as soon as the racing post article came out, Anthony Bromley rang me up straight away and said, I've just read this. It's devastating what's happened to you, but anything you need, just give me a shout and I'll do everything I can to help you with your, with your, you know, with your aspiring career in this. And the first sale I went to was the, the Doncaster May store sale. I was with Anthony. So we kept in touch and um, he's been fantastic. Even got the invite to the Million in Mind open day the other week. So, uh, so no, he, we, we've become good friends and, and I'm learning a lot from him and, like yeah, like you said, being up to the national stud to look at stallions, and again, just all off the articles, these people have got in touch with me, and yeah, racing community is very, very close knit, and it's really shown with how they, how that, how I've been treated since the accident. Very good. And you like, you've always liked going to the sales anyway. I think Tattersalls and and uh, and the like. Yeah, even before, even before the accident. Yeah, I went a couple of times when I was at St. Mark's. Um, didn't have a clue what was going on back then. Um, it's far too wet behind the ears. But uh, 
yeah I've, I've always enjoyed that and, and looking at that and i've actually just purchased a brood mare um from france um so uh i took my granddad to that million in mind open day to kind of sweeten him up because he's gone from having a couple of horses to now having a retired point to pointer and now he's got now he's got a brood mare on the farm um she's coming over from france and the nice story about that is is she's actually the mare who gave me my first winner in france um and my biggest winner i won on her twice so yeah kind of i wouldn't have just bought any brood mare but i thought there's a bit of sentimental value with that with that and she's special to me so with a good page so um she she should be coming over soon so it's exciting times really yeah well and it's good for your, your granddad as well he's the one that started you off on on this journey in horse racing yeah you know he's obviously he was gutted that if he hit him hard and it was gutted that my dream and you know his dream of wanting to see me do really well was over but now we've got this to kind of throw ourselves into and we're going to go and see the stallion together and you know he'll obviously be heavily involved and and um yeah it's exciting it's really exciting and this can kind of be something I do during my table tennis to keep me involved in everything. And then bloodstock would be more of a long-term thing because you're always learning. So there's no point rushing into it. I, that's what I think anyway. Yeah, there's a lot Build to up know. contacts. A lot to know there. Um, we said off air, and I've read this as well, that you don't think that you're um, an inspiration. But why do, you, why do you think that? Well, it's just, I don't know. It's just... Because there are there are a lot of other people in my situation who are far more inspiring or have done far more inspiring things. Um, you know, I, I've only just spent, you know, it's only been a year since the accident and all I've basically been doing is visiting things, getting out and about and doing rehab. You know, I haven't done any any incredible achievements you know, there's there's no Paralympic gold, for example, around my neck yet, or there's no, you know. Um, but um, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and um, like Ed Jackson's and watching a couple of documentaries of, um, there was a Rising Phoenix one of the Paralympics. And that really kind of, when you watch stuff like that, that kind of made me feel inspired to go and just, just get up and do things really. Um, but it's, um, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't have ever called myself inspiring. No, not at all. It's just what getting I, on with life. Yeah. What I found inspiring is reading the article in the racing post. And you perhaps you can sort of elaborate on this is the, um, story about when you were swimming recently, um, doing the, I think you were going to do 10 lengths and you'd done six, but you stopped and then you, you restarted and finished. That was actually the, the the first year anniversary of that was on the twenty third of June, twenty uh, of this year. So it was uh, one year to the day. So I probably shouldn't have been doing something so strenuous because emotions were all over the shop. And it was down in Winchester. It was in a hydro pool, and hydro pools are, are very hot. They're about thirty five degrees. Um, we had to do a, a six minute swimming fitness test. So probably slightly too hot to really be doing that. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm quite fit now. I'm I'm in a good position rehab wise and strong. But obviously swimming fitness is completely different. And I did four lengths of front crawl and my arms were were, were knackered. So I decided I'd do uh breaststroke. Um, so I did two lengths of that and I went and the target was <laughs> target was 10 to 12. So we're at six at this point and probably about three, three and a half minutes of the way through. And they were egging me on and, you know, giving me, you know, keep going. And I remember pushing off, sticking my head under the water and my arms just laying by my side. And it was something, you know, just that. Um, and I was never a, a, a swimmer in the first place. You know, I was never a big fan of it. So, and I remember 
just sticking my head over the water and says, I- I'm done. And then obviously you can't put your foot down or anything. So I just started to sink and they came and saved me, which for me, I always find embarrassing. And I remember just sitting there be feeling, you know, quite emotional and not that I was showing it, but inside. And it was, you know, just that frustration of just not being able to do more because of the the lack of use of 75% of your body and tired and um could say upset over just the day itself but i looked at the physio and, and i was kind of like Do you know on there this is this six six to me doesn't feel good enough so i buckled down and i did another two and a lot of people who i've heard since spinal cord injury says that they learn you know you learn a lot more about yourself and you they become a lot better person and i think in those two lengths going up and down which took a minute 45 to do 10 lengths and it's not a 25 meter swimming pool it's not a very big one um i definitely pushed through a lot of barriers mentally and felt like that i, I kind of learned a lot about myself and was just proud of such a small achievement really but it, it it just showed me that actually then really a lot of things are possible for someone like myself so don't put up any barriers um and i recently recently listened to a a paralympian an american paralympian who climbed who was the first paraplegic to climb kilimanjaro unassisted and the motto he said was, it's not what happens to us. It's what we do with what happens with us or what happened to us. So, yeah. Now, well, thank, thank you very much for sharing that with us. It should be, I know you say you're not, but it should be an inspiration to all of us uh, in how we go about our lives. And what your, with your rehab, what's the prognosis? Is the hope that you will get more mobility? Well, my spinal cord was only compressed, so there's always a question mark really on on how on how much will how much I will recover because we just don't know how badly the nerves were damaged when it got compressed um, doctors and and you know specialists will say that with spinal cord injuries you've got eighteen months to two years and what we'll, and after that, basically, that's your window. And if after that amount of time, if you're still in a wheelchair, there's still no movement, then you're probably not going to to get it. But we, you know, we live with hope, and 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 that's all we can do. It's not something that it's not a door that I've shut, you know, ever trying to walk again. But it, I've definitely had to and have come to accept the fact that there is a high chance that it won't happen. Um, and you know, I suppose you have to just say that you're okay with that because you, you, you're not going to get through the day resting on the thought of, oh, I hope I do walk again. Um, so yeah, we, we do everything we can. That's what this year was. It was a year to, to throw everything into those rehab sessions. Um, but I'm not going to be a permanent patient. And, um, as of next year, it will be kind of doing it to maintain your body and you know the rehab and we'll see what happens really but like I said I have recovered a little bit of stuff nothing in my legs and it's only minimum and minimal stuff in the stomach but that's not to say that that in uh, three four five years time I won't recover more it's spinal cord injuries are different for everyone and I suppose the brain, the brain is quite a powerful thing. So who knows? Well, it sounds like you've you've thrown everything into it since since the accident. Finally, is there any people you particularly like to thank who've helped you over the last eighteen months, or are there so many that have helped? There, you? there, yeah, there is. Obviously, uh, mum and dad, nan and granddad, and well, and all the the close family have been fantastic, um, and the the three rehab places injured jockeys fund matt hampson up in melton maybe the matt hampson center and hobbs rehabilitation 
they've been huge. Um, and then as for close friends, I mentioned in the Racing Post article, uh, there was four, Alice, Felix, Recent, and Freddie. And then there's, there's, been, there's been lots of other very, very good close friends as well who have, who have been fantastic. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's far too many to count, really. Um, well, thank you. Hopefully one day you'll be that um, gold medal will be around your neck at the, the Paralympics. Uh, uh, and I'd love to catch up with you again on the, the podcast to, to see how you're getting on for a, for a future programme. And best of luck also with your bloodstock career and all the rehab. And thank you very much for joining me and telling me your story on the paddock and the pavilion. No, thank you very much for having me, Stephen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and now on Instagram at The Pad and Pav. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network. Don't forget that your skin is your largest organ, and the sun can be your skin's worst enemy. Dermatologist recommended Neutrogena products offer the ultimate protection for your skin. From makeup remover wipes to Hydro Boost Water Gel Facial Moisturizer, BJ's has your entire lineup of Neutrogena skincare products. And now through December 3rd, save $4 on any Neutrogena product at BJ's. Love your skin back and save now through December 3rd, only at BJ's.